Welcome to the program, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that this finds you and your family doing well. And I wanna thank you very much for joining me. My name is Justin Peters, and I'm your host for the next seven programs dealing with spiritual warfare. I'm joined with, or joined by rather, Jim Osmond. Jim Osmond is the pastor of Kootenai Community Church in Sandpoint, Idaho. Jim is my pastor, and he is also my dear friend. And Jim, in our previous episode, we introduced the topic of spiritual warfare, talked a little bit about your book entitled Truth or Territory, A Biblical Approach to Spiritual Warfare. Mm. And as the title implies, uh, there are two basic approaches, but very different approaches to spiritual warfare. So give us a little uh, yeah. recap of that. So quickly, the, the, uh, the territory view says that Satan controls territory and the spiritual warfare is in essence a battle to regain that territory whether it's geographical territory or spiritual territory. And so the means then that are employed to regain that toward territory are things like praying hedges of thorns around people, uh, canceling generational curses. That would be claiming the territory of your family or people and uh, your lineage, <clears throat> your bloodline, etc. cetera. Um, or binding and then rebuking Satan, uh, spiritual, uh, strategic level spiritual warfare or what's called spiritual mapping where you identify different uh, spiritual principalities over geographic areas, and then you go about the work of praying against and binding and casting them down and exercising them, et cetera, and, and breaking their power over geographical areas. And the, and the whole goal of the territory view is that we push back the powers of darkness through these various methods in order that we can then advance with the gospel. We bring the gospel in and, and uh, that Satan needs to be pushed back in order that he not affect us and influence us assault us, oppress us, possess us, all of those things. So that's the territory view. These, these methods are employed in order to gain territory. And of course, if you don't employ these methods, then Satan, of course, can gain that territory back. Right. So right. it's like two football teams on a football field trying to advance the ball. And if you're on yeah. offense, you're pushing back the defense. If you're on defense, you're trying to hold the offense. Yeah. And uh, so that's, yeah. that's kind of the view. You're trying to take, take as much territory as you can in order to score a goal. And Satan is trying to do the opposite. Yeah. The truth view in essence is that spiritual warfare is a battle for the truth. Yeah. And therefore we advance it with the truth that God has given to us, his word. And we talked about in our last program, the sufficiency of scripture and how really every ill that plagues evangelicalism can be traced back directly to a, 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 a practical denial yeah. of the sufficiency of scripture. And uh, nowhere is that more true in this, this issue dealing with spiritual warfare. Right. And so uh, our primary text, the, the text that I've read your book, of course, endorsed your book. <laughs> you wrote the foreword. I wrote the foreword, yeah. Yeah, I wrote the foreword to the book. So your, uh, your primary text here that kind of sets the theme for your book as a whole is 2 Corinthians 10, yeah, 3, three through 5. Yeah, 3 through 6, and you're going to read that. Yeah. Okay, I will. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses or strongholds. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. And uh, Jim, one of the fundamental rules of hermeneutics is that you need to take verses of Scripture in their proper right. context. So give us a little bit of the context here, the background information, and why this is your text to uh, guide yeah. us in our approach of spiritual so warfare. in 2 Corinthians, Paul was defending his ministry, his calling, his apostolic credentials, his apostolic authority, uh, his own integrity and reputation, because... Uh, having corrected the Corinthians in the first letter that he wrote them, he had now come under tremendous assault from super apostles or false apostles who were slandering Paul and accusing him of all kinds of uh, horrible compromises of character and, and, and integrity and ministry. And, and he had begun to woo the hearts of the Corinthians away from their beloved apostle Paul who had founded the church and sacrificed so much for the church. And in 2 Corinthians, we only get one side of the story. So we, we, don't, we don't actually hear what the accusations were specifically, but we do hear Paul's response to those accusations. Right. So like hearing one side of a phone call, you can, you can pretty much figure out what the other side of the phone call is saying by listening to the one side. Right. Um, and so that's what we get in 2 Corinthians. 
the church was in shambles in terms of its theology, its doctrine, it, and, and though there had been some repentance for some sin uh, that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians, there seems to be little indication that things had, that the ship had been fully righted by the time we get to 2 Corinthians. And so Paul comes to them to confront some of these false teachers and to compare their accusations with the truth, to compare his ministry to their ministry. And so you have kind of a, of, of a weeping apostle bearing his heart to this church that should love him, that he, desper- that he, that he diligently loved and that should love him in return. Mm-hmm. And in bearing his heart to them, he, he's writing this epistle about his ministry, his methodology, his philosophy, and basically showing to them, look, we didn't, we didn't come to you to get your money. We didn't come to you to insult you. We didn't come to you to take advantage of you. Uh, we came to you in truth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 2, Paul is coming to confront these false teachers about their lies. And then in verse 6, he speaks of being ready to punish all disobedience um, when he finds it there and coming to them to be able to punish all disobedience in order to make their obedience complete. And so in the middle between verses 2 and verse 6, we have this text describing and defining really Paul's ministry. He talks about a contrast between himself and the false teachers. He contrasts his ministry with the ministry of the false teachers. He contrasts his methods with the methods of the false teacher. They were opposite in every way. And that's where you get this this mention of the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And it's intended to contrast that with the weapons of the false teachers, the false that accusers were carnal. that were carnal. And, and he basically says, we, we are wanting to wage our spiritual warfare and conduct our ministry in the truth. And he describes there in that passage that you read, taking, destroying speculations and taking every thought captive and, and destroying every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And it's very tempting in the church and as Christians to walk our spiritual life in the flesh. Um, before we come to Christ, that's all we know is what it means to walk in the flesh. And so walking in the Spirit is something that needs to be learned, um, is something that needs to be, we need to discipline ourselves to do it. And it's not something that comes easy. Yeah. And the Corinthians, um, Paul came to Corinth on his second missionary journey and, and he found these Corinthians and they, were, they, they weren't irreligious. They had come from pagan religious backgrounds, mm-hmm. uh, Apollinarian, Dionysian cults. And what they were doing is they were, they were taking some of these pagan ideas, pagan practices, and kind of bringing them into the church and, and corrupting the God's truth and mm-hmm. mixing that in with some, some pagan notions, pagan ideologies. And they were, they were wanting to do it their own way. They were kind of mixing together uh, biblical truth, God's truth, with some pagan notions and pagan ideologies, correct? Yeah. Yeah, the, their fleshly approach to life and ministry is evident all the way through the even the first epistle to the Corinthians. They, they elevated human wisdom above divine wisdom, and they valued it. They valued oratory and the ability to, to speak in flowery, eloquent language. They, uh, they were actually valued. Um, they, they were focusing on the their human teachers, and so there were divisions among them. Some saying, "I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos," and that's something right. you would find in the pagan culture, not something you would should should find within the church. Um, they were going to law courts against one another, even, um, and, and, and even approaching the, the divisions that existed among them and the differences and, the, and any conflicts between them. They would go to court, and that was the, going to the secular world in, in a worldly way instead of dealing with it in-house within the church. And so the, the name of Christ was being blasphemed by all of their various methods and means of, of really living according to their own flesh and their own way of, of doing things. Even the spiritual gifts, they valued, they valued gifts which were were showy and demonstrative right. and spectacular rather than humility, which is the way of the cross. Right. It's a good thing we don't have any of that today. No, we don't have it. The church <laughs> has moved on so far past that, right? You know, just as you're saying that, that's exactly what we see today, uh, especially within the charismatic movement. As, as the Corinthians were boasting in the, their supposed use of the spiritual gifts, look at me, look how spiritual I am, look how much I speak in tongues, look what I can do. Uh, this approach to spiritual warfare is the same error, just repackaged a little bit differently, right? It uh, is, yeah. Look at, you know, I can cast out demons. I can rebuke Satan. I can do this. I can do that. It is a, it is in a way a, a way of a personal uh, aggrandizement, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. And, and once again, not to get too far off uh, off the off the beam here, but um, 
the church has approached, the church has, the church has adopted worldly methodology in all kinds of areas. The church growth movement that we see in our day of having uh, flashy themes and stage, stage productions and entertainment and all right. of that, it, it all is an embrace of what the world wants, what the world desires and craves, what the world would have, and the church is capitulating to that. And the same thing happens with spiritual warfare. We, we want to make sure that when we are engaging in spiritual warfare, that we understand what Scripture says about it, and that we're not doing this according to uh, the testimony of an ex-Satanist or the testimony of, a, uh, of, of somebody who came out of that movement or the testimony even of a demon. Right. Uh, God's way is always opposite to the world's way. Right. And so whether it's, it's preaching instead of entertainment or whether it's um, wisdom, God's wisdom instead of the world's wisdom, or whether it is appro approaching the spirit our task of spiritual warfare and ministry in the truth, as opposed to all these carnal, bizarre, mystical, and even pagan notions of what spiritual warfare is, God's way is always different than the world. Yeah. We might even ask as to an unbeliever, whatever you think, whatever you think is most natural to an unbeliever is completely opposite in the church exactly. and in the kingdom of God. Right, absolutely. So when Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 10, this passage, when he talks about the, the fortresses that must be destroyed and lofty things that are raised up against the, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of Christ, uh, this is, as your book says, this is a, a, not a battle for territory, it's a battle for truth. We're battling for, we're battling for the mind, yeah, right? Yeah, we are. We're battling for men's minds. Yeah, we, we want the minds of men to be brought captive to the Lord Jesus Christ. So. Um, what is it that we fight in spiritual warfare? And ultimately, we would say, we, we always say that our enemy is not a physical enemy. Mm -hmm. right? when, we are, when we are sharing the gospel with a Muslim or we're dealing with a false religion or a false religious system, ultimately we want to re remind people that the, the, the physical person in front of us is not the enemy. That the enemy is a spiritual enemy. Satan right. is the enemy. Correct. And ultimately, he is the enemy. But how is it that we take captives from him and deliver them into the kingdom of God? What are the tools that God has given to us? Is it binding and rebuking, hexes and hedges and spiritual mapping? Are those the tools that God has given to us? Exorcisms and exercising our authority in Christ, are those the tools? Or do we deliver men from the kingdom of Satan by assaulting the the, the lofty fortresses, the, the false ideologies that hold men captive? And, and that's what I am saying that, that 2 Corinthians 10 is teaching. The true, true biblical spiritual warfare is really a battle for the minds of men because they are held in bondage to Satan by believing the lies that he has told them. Yes. Not by being part of territory that he has taken, but by believing the lies that he has told them. So really we are after men's mental fortresses. Yes, indeed. And we see a lot of these fortresses today. Um, evolution, mm -hmm. atheism, moral relativism. Um, Postmodernism. Postmodernism. Progressivism. Right. Right. Yeah, so. these are the these are the false ideologies and false thinkings that that occupy men's mind, and and not all of them are atheistic, uh, like right. you know, liberalism and naturalism, humanism, secularism. Not all of them are atheistically oriented. We also have false ideologies that are are religiously oriented. Right. Um, the Roman Catholic Church keeps men in bondage by making them believe the superstitious notions of of of, uh, of what the church teaches. Um, people believe right. lies about justification by faith and sanctification and the truth of Scripture and who is in authority. Those are all lies that the devil has told. So whether we're talking about the false religious systems of Roman Catholicism or Islam or whether you're talking about aberrant lies told by the charismatic movement and even people within evangelical Christianity, those lies are the things that must be assaulted. So anytime we, anytime we attack the lies with the truth by proclaiming the truth, teaching the truth, loving the truth, advancing the truth, sharing the truth in some way, we are, that is spiritual warfare. It's not, yeah. I bind you Satan. It's, right. here's what the Word of God says. This is, we're, we're standing on Scripture. This is what Scripture says. You need to understand it. You need to believe it. You need to live according to it. You need to yeah. obey it. And right. if you do not, you will perish. So the proclamation of the gospel, discipleship, all these, that is true spiritual warfare, not yeah. imaginary bindings. Yeah. Spiritual warfare is when you get up to preach on Sunday morning, when, when your exactly. pastor gets up to preach on Sunday morning, when John MacArthur or whoever, as long as your pastor is preaching God's Word uh, verse by verse, uh, that is where real spiritual warfare is, is mm -hmm. 
taken place. Yeah, the teaching of the truth in a Sunday school classroom or a home Bible study, that's right. spiritual warfare. You're advancing the truth, you're teaching the truth, you are, you are seeking Doing to evangelism. Evangelism, one-on-one -on -one evangelism, street evangelism, open air preaching. The apologetic enterprise that we, that we as Christians we ought to be engaged in is a, is a method of waging spiritual warfare. Right. Right? We, we are wanting to take the truth and to make that dominant in men's minds and in their thinking. Right. We want to make that dominant in their life so that they obey it, they hear it, and they're transformed by it, that they're sanctified by the truth. Yes. And, and that is what we seek to advance in spiritual warfare. We, we're calling it spiritual warfare because we're, we're using a term that other people use, but we, we don't even, when you and I talk about evangelism or preaching and teaching, we're not, we don't even talk in terms of we're doing Correct. spiritual warfare. Right. Right. You're preaching the word, you're teaching the word. And, and what we're saying is that is spiritual warfare. All yep. of this other stuff that is called spiritual warfare is not is spiritual, not spiritual warfare. warfare. That word you keep using, I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> the Nigo Montoya. That's right. That's that's not spiritual warfare, and yeah. and those practices are not biblical. Right. And and that's a lie that we need to deliver men from. Yeah. Paul says in Romans one sixteen, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto mm. salvation. Not, not. Uh, and not breaking curses and binding Satan. No, you, you preach the gospel, that's where the power is. Right. And all of these others are just uh, cheap uh, imitations. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're, you're, you're trading in the big guns of the gospel for spitballs of, yeah. of um, you know, carnal methods and methods. These other methods are, are really, um, they're really carnal, they're, they are that, they are carnal methods. They are uh, insignificant and they're a distraction from the real war that we ought to be waging, which is over the truth right. of the Word of God and, and sharing that with men. Well, we always tell people to be Bereans and search mm -hmm. the scriptures and see if these things are so. So let's go to a couple of texts that support yeah. uh, exactly what we've been talking about. Uh, so both of these are to the Corinthians back in the first epistle to the Corinthians in chapter one of that, verses 18 to 24, Paul writes, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And you see there, Paul saying, basically, the world wants this, and we, we give them the exact opposite of what they want. Right. They want wisdom, flowery eloquence, and right. flowery language, and they want presentations, and they want to be entertained. And, and we're telling them the wisdom of God is this, and so we preach Christ. And to them, that's foolishness, but that's what we give them. They want the opposite of what we give them, and we give them the opposite of what they want. Exactly. And, uh, and that's what spiritual warfare is. He speaks there in that passage about the word of the cross, saving those who believe. That's what destroys the wisdom of the wise. So yeah. you get the wise man who says, no, in, in our wisdom, we believe that uh, there is no God. In our wisdom, we believe that... Um, man is the measure of all things. We believe that morals are something that we fabricate, or we have a, we have, we believe in progressivism or secularism or whatever it is, even the false religious systems. And and we come in with the truth and say, no, we're going to destroy your wisdom with the preaching of the gospel. Yeah. And here is the truth, and we believe that the truth is powerful enough and effective enough to destroy those false methodologies, those false mindsets, ideologies, worldviews, systems of thinking. Right. Errors that Satan tells. Right. In our next text, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, Paul says, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Now, Jim, I have, I have heard some uh, preachers take this verse out of context, twist its meaning, and they say, see right there, Paul says, he did not come in persuasive words, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. So that's, that's signs and wonders, right? So that, that's that's well, what convinces people of... In the context, it's the preaching of the Word, because at the very end of the last chapter, the previous chapter, which we just read to you, Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. And right. That, that, for Paul, was the power of the Spirit. Yes. It is the preaching of the Word, which is the power of the Spirit. It's not the showy signs. It's not the big demonstrations. That's right. 
Uh, it's not the flash and the spectacular, the spe spectacular demonstrations. It is the preaching of the word, which itself is the power of God unto salvation. Right. I, I think of, of what um, Abraham said in Luke 16, you know, the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man and Lazarus both died and went to their respective places. And the rich man woke up in the lake of fire and shortening this, of course, but he, he cried out, he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my five brothers and warn them not to come to this place. And, and Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Mm -hmm. No, Father Abraham, but if someone were to come from them from the dead, then they will believe, then they will repent. If they can just see a sign and wonder, if they can just see a miracle. And Abraham said, if they will not hear Moses, if they will not hear the prophets, neither will they believe, even if someone were to come back from the dead. Right. So that is, uh, that is proof right there that there's an inherent power in the Word of God right. that is not found in miracles and uh, signs and wonders. Uh, and the vast majority of these, of course, nowadays they're lying signs and wonders. Right. But that's not where the power is. The power is in the gospel. The power is in the Word of God. Yeah, you, you see in John chapter 11 when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and the Pharisees were standing there, some of them watching that happen. And, and they went back and told some of the other Pharisees and they said, we, we need to kill this man because if he continues on, all men will believe in him. Right. So they, they watched Jesus raise somebody from the dead and, and they knew what his claims were. They knew he claimed to be God. He claimed to be the Messiah, the son of David, king of Israel. They knew what his claims were and they, and they understood that full well. And yet, even in spite of that miracle, they would not believe. And, right. I, and I said when I was preaching through the Gospel of John, unbelief is never due to a lack of evidence. It's always due to a love for darkness. That's right. And as long as somebody loves darkness, it does not matter how much evidence you set in front of them, they will find a way of explaining it away. If uh, Even if God, if, I've heard atheists say, well, I would believe in God if he were to show up and speak to me and demonstrate it. I tell, I, my response to that is if, if God showed up and spoke to you, you wouldn't believe. You would seek out a psychiatrist. You would think you were right. going loony. There's right. no amount of evidence that will convince somebody who loves darkness because the love for darkness is always more powerful than the evidence. They'll always explain away the evidence. The, the atheist does it. He sits on a planet of evidence surrounded by a universe of evidence and he denies the truth. Exactly. It's because he loves darkness. Suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Right. So what is the only thing that can break through that? Are we, are we supposed to... Uh, bind Satan and rebuke him and pray hedges and cancel generational curses and identify spiritual principalities and pray against them by name? Is that what we are to do? I don't believe it is. I believe that our approach to do that is to preach the Word of God, to give the truth of Scripture. And we, and in doing that, we leave, let the chips fall where they may. Yep. We leave it up to God to convert the heart of the sinner and to open the eyes and the mind. And uh, we believe that God is sovereign in that and that he will, he will bring people, he will bring his people to faith in the truth as a result of the preaching of the gospel. So it's not signs and wonders that Paul is talking about there in the spirit and power. He's talking about the word of God. When you preach the word of God, the spirit of God uses that powerfully to break down men's fortresses. Remember right. Paul says we're, we're assaulting every lofty thing, every speculation, every worldly ideology and, and lofty thought that raises itself up in opposition to God. Right. Men are held captive in their mental fortresses. Right. I will not believe the truth because I love darkness and so I have believed a worldview or an ideology that keeps me happy in my darkness. Yeah. Keeps me right. happy in my flesh. They're slaves to the world, slaves to sin, slaves to false ideologies. Yeah. And we want to enslave people too. We we right. want to we want to we want to make you a slave. We want to deliver you from the slavery of the world and, and the bondage of the world and bondage of sin and make you a slave of Christ. Yeah. And all men are slaves, the only question is. All men are slaves. Who, who, who is your master? You yep. Whom do you serve? Yeah. Yeah, Amen. so this this is an important topic because we're discussing a, a biblical methodology versus a modern methodology. And when we're talking about spiritual warfare in these terms of truth or territory, we're talking about different objectives, different weapons, different enemy, a different source of intelligence. The truth view says scripture is our source of intelligence. The the territory view says we can get sources of intelligence from all kinds of places. We can talk to demons. We can talk to ex-Satanists. We can look at our experiences, what works, what doesn't work. Right. The truth view says that we have ob objected to bring men into captivity to Christ and his kingdom. The territory view says that our goal is to fight back the powers of darkness, to bind the devils, and to kick them out of our, ha our towns and our houses. Yeah. Um, the truth view of spiritual warfare says that our weapon is the truth. Yeah. The preaching of the word, the advancement of the word of God. The territory view says our weapons are hexes and hedges and canceling curses and yeah. rebuking and binding Satan and right. all of that. So it, it, is, right. it is really in every way two entirely different views of spiritual warfare. Indeed. All right. 
Good stuff. Well, dear friends, I hope you are enjoying this is a series of programs on spiritual warfare, two in the hopper, and we have six more to go. And uh, Jim, again, the title of the book is Truth or Territory, and people may find this book where? On Amazon.com. Amazon.com, Truth or Territory. And you have written other books as well. Uh, yeah, we actually have. There's, there's two others there that you're off to your left. Selling, selling the Stairway to Heaven. Yeah, so, so this book is a critique of Colton Burpo's account of heaven that he has as a four-year-old boy a critique of Don Piper's account of, of heaven as uh, uh, that he went for 90 minutes supposedly. And it is a critique of a man named Eben Alexander, who's not even a Christian, doesn't even claim to be a Christian. Uh, he claims that he went to heaven and he talks about what he saw. And so what I do in this book is I compare their accounts with themselves, because they are self-contradictory. I compare their accounts with each other. And the reason I brought in an unbeliever into this, uh, into this book in order to contrast the Christian view of the afterlife with the non-Christian view of the afterlife and to show the, the lunacy of embracing what Bol, uh, uh, Burpo and Piper say about the afterlife while you reject Eben Alexander. If you're going to say that men are visiting heaven, then Eben Alexander did not go to any place of torment or torture, and he was an unbeliever. He claims he went to heaven. So if we're going to embrace the experience of one, on what basis do we reject the experience of right. the other? And I make the point that we ought not to be trusting any of these supposed visitation to heaven claims. They're, they're all bogus and they're lies. And, and I also offer in the book uh, ways of explaining what I do believe they believe were real experiences. Yeah. And your other book is entitled Prosperity of the Wicked and this is an exposition of Psalm 73. Uh, this is a little uh, bit different book than the other two. A little two. bit different book, yeah. But uh, uh, this is an excellent, if you've ever wondered, you know, the age old question, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Of course, that's not the right question because none of us are good people. Uh, but this deals with uh, the question that Asaph had in Psalm 73. Why do the wicked prosper? Why does it seem like wicked people prosper and righteous people seem to suffer? Mm -hmm. And so that's what this book is, correct? Yeah, that's correct. It, it basically, the, I think there's an old Jewish proverb that says, if you want to know what God thinks about wealth, just look at the people that he gives it to. And so we look around at, at, at the world and we see all these people who are unbelievers and they're wicked and, and, and yet they just seem to enjoy life and, and all of the good life. And you wonder, why does God give wealth to the wicked? Why doesn't he give it to his people? And this book answers that question. What is God doing? Yeah. What, is, what is God accomplishing when he gives wealth to unbelievers? Yeah. Excellent book, excellent book. All right, Jim, uh, thank you very much for joining me for the program. Mm -hmm. And uh, dear ones, I hope that this has been helpful for you, encouraging, edifying for you. And uh, we have six more programs coming and we're going to get into some more of the nuts and bolts of what true spiritual warfare is. So thank you for joining me. Until our next time together, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all.